Welcome to Thursdays at the Museum. I'm Ian Rapnicki. I'm a Community Engagement Manager with the DIA. I wanted to start by thanking the residents of Macomb, Oakland, and Wayne Counties for your generous millage support. That support provides free general admission for Tri-County residents, it provides free school field trips, community programs, and specialty programming for adults 55 and older, which includes free bus transportation to the museum. Today, I'm excited to invite you into the studio of printmaker Mary Broadbeck as she shares her work and discusses her process in which she uses traditional Japanese wood blocking printing techniques to depict scenery inspired by the Great Lakes region. And if you'd like to ask a question during today's program, you can do so by signing into YouTube and leaving a comment or if you're watching on Facebook, you can leave a comment there as well. Questions will be fielded by today's host, DIA Studio Coordinator, Zach Freeling. So without further ado, let's visit with Mary Broadbeck and Zach. Hi. Hey, Ian, thank Hi. you. Hi, thank you, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mary, how are you today? I'm great, thanks, how are you? I'm doing good, and thanks to everyone for joining us. If this is your first time, this is our monthly um, studio visit where we talk with um, local and I guess slightly less local artists as well. Mary, you're joining us from Kalamazoo today, right? Kalamazoo, yes. That's great. Um, and Mary, you're a printmaker. We're gonna pull up some slides here and talk a little bit about what that entails. And I just wanted to point this out right away, uh, this lovely photo. So you're holding one of your wood blocks there, correct? Right. Uh, right. I'll be talking about the process um, as we go along here, but that's one of the blocks. Um, that picture in the background is the image from that block that I'm holding, the background on the on the right. Oh, nice. Cool. And we have one of your finished uh, pieces here just as kind of a sample, and we're going to kind of work our way starting, not quite the beginning, but starting a little bit further back and working up, but just to, to show, you know, a piece that's a typical of your current work. This is from 2022, I see there. And, you know, we, right. when we work with students at the museum, uh, we say, you know, who knows what a print is, or can you tell us what it, what it means to make a print? And the example we'll give, or that kids will give is, you know, a hand print, a footprint, uh, making an impression, uh, making something that you can make copies of. Does that sound about right, Mary? Uh, right. A uh, print uh, is an impression on paper. Uh, well, a, a fine art print is an impression on paper made from something, something else. Um, in my case, uh, it's from a carving in wood. It could be linoleum, it could be steel, copper. Um, and then usually if there are multiple colors, there's uh, different matrices, different, in my case, wood. So the different colors um, have uh, different blocks for each color, and then they're assembled. So I work in the Japanese tradition, which is uh, unique from the Western tradition by the uh, use of uh, water-based colors versus uh, viscous, typically oil-based colors. Um, and yeah, so here's an example of a recent uh, print of mine. Uh, it's called a float. It's part of my water lily series. And yeah, you can see at the bottom, uh, yep. there's, there's an addition number. Uh, when you make a print, you can make more than one original. Um, I think this is number six of 30. Um, and then of course you see my signature and the title. So it's, uh, on paper, uh, handmade Japanese paper. I buy it from Japan. Fortunately, I can order it online. So, yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah, and uh, this is a beautiful image. Let's look at it, look ahead. So you inserted this slide in here and you wanted to talk a bit about um, the Great Lakes and the connection um, between that right. and your artwork. Yeah, a lot of people ask, well, how did you ever get into Japanese woodblock printmaking? And well, that's a very good question because I didn't really have any exposure to Japanese culture or Japanese art growing up. I actually grew up on a dairy farm. Um, right now, I live in Kalamazoo. That's the the bottom little star on the on the on the lower portion. And I also have a studio and home in the Keweenaw Peninsula. 
I really love uh, Lake Superior and the northern region. A lot of my work over the years has been of uh, the uh, Lake Superior watershed region. Um, and I think everyone that's probably watching this show today uh, is familiar with how beautiful our Great Lakes are and the also the very unique image that it is from space and, or on a map. I've always been interested by the shapes of the Great Lakes and how it defines our beautiful state. Um, and, you know, look, I didn't really think about this uh, when I was first getting into printmaking, but sort of like in retrospect and in, in looking back, I can see that my interest in shapes goes all the way back to uh, looking at Michigan on a map and the Great Lakes. Nice. And my first my first career um, actually was in industrial design, and I was a furniture designer. And uh, one of the one of the things that I created was work service shapes that went together uh, to create different configurations for office furniture. And I did this for many years. I actually have patents in furniture uh, for Steelcase and Hayworth, uh, oh. both in West Michigan. Um, but uh, there was a, a there came a point in time where I felt like I needed to have a closer relationship with nature, and so I just went into the landscape and uh, started doing drawings. And I I started using uh, sumi ink and uh, uh, Japanese brush uh, for no other reason than I, I, it just appealed to me. So this is an early landscape um, uh, drawing uh, that I did, uh, and this was in 1990. And then as time went on, I happened to take a, a class at Oxbow in Saugatuck, where I made my first woodblock print. And that's on the left there. And as you can see, it's uh, there's a big cloud shape. Um, so I, you know, when I first started making my artwork and being gravitated towards uh, woodcut, I was still constructing things in shapes versus mark making or, or drawing. Um, so the one on the left is uh, a single color image uh, made in the Western tradition with oil-based inks. Uh, and the ink is rolled on with like a rubber roller or briar. And then, um, Eventually, I taught myself uh, how to make uh, color woodblock prints with uh, one color on each block, and that's the one on the on the right, the image on the right. But again, like I was talking about, I I still saw the world in basic shapes, and so color woodblock printmaking, where you assemble the the complete image um, from colors off of different blocks was really uh, something that uh, came natural to me. And I'll talk a little bit, I'll talk a lot more about uh, how this is all done uh, as we go on here. All right, that's so interesting seeing, you know, the, those connections between the lakes and the furniture and the prints and the drawings that, you know, these shapes that, you know, kind of seem different, but then when you break it down that way, these connections kind of start to form. So uh, in the, Later part of the 1990s, I got married and moved to Kalamazoo, Michigan. And there's a there was a, a master's program at Western Michigan University in fine arts. And uh, I applied and got in uh, for printmaking. And it was my teachers there that said, oh, Mary, you've got to study in Japan. And it's like, OK. So uh, I guess I saw something in, in my work that, you know, really fit with the Japanese aesthetic and I, I agreed. So I signed up uh, for Japanese language classes right away. Uh, and my teachers connected me with a teacher in Japan that, and that's him there, Yoshisuke Funasaka. And he applied for a fellowship from the Japanese government on my behalf. And so I got a fellowship to go to Tokyo to study with him. 
uh, for five months, and that was in 1998. Um, so, and it was a very generous uh, fellowship, and um, I just decided to become dedicated to it uh, from that moment on. That's, that's great. That must have been quite a quite an experience. And when you yeah. were in Tokyo, were you was it pretty much um, were you mostly in the studio, mostly working? Were you were you spending time out in nature, doing your drawing and sketching, and finding inspiration there as well? What was it? What was your time like there? That's a very good question because I I couldn't feel I didn't feel like I could just make whatever I was doing before. I felt like I had to go out into the landscape and be immersed in that environment. So I did uh, do I don't have any examples of it, but I did do uh, scenes from the Japanese park mm. in in Japan. Well, that's great. I also might add that even though I did. Uh, I, I did study the language. <laughs> I didn't do very well. And uh, so when I got there, I wanted to take another, you know, continue with my language studies. And my teacher, my sensei, he said, don't worry about it. You know, sure. you're not expected to, he, know, he knew English well enough to tell me not to worry about it and not to spend my time studying the language, study mm -hmm. the art. So I actually, I learned um, the, art for mostly by watching not mm. by having it explained to me yeah. uh, because it was mostly in the Jap japanese language so mm. it's a visual art so you know you learn by watching and then by doing yeah. so i did spend a lot of time in my apartment just practicing oh, that's great during that during that five month period that's great so um what what is a print uh well, first of all, I I might just bring up this picture real quick. All right. uh, I'm, I'm sure you all know, or are you familiar with uh, Hokusai's Great Wave? And this is the process that I was there in Japan to learn. And um, like I mentioned earlier, what is so different about the Japanese process over Western process is the the inks and then how the inks are applied to the blocks uh woodblock printmaking is uh, one of the oldest forms of printmaking it's a relief process which means that the non-image area is what is carved away and the remaining area left raised is then inked and then paper placed upon it and the back of the paper is pressed so it transfers to the paper. And you can see that the, the image or the block and the image on the paper are mirror images. Um, so this is, a, this is an early example of a Japanese woodblock print, which was uh, religious in content. Nice. Yeah, that mirror imaging. Sing, single color, yeah. That mirror imaging is always a big, uh, issue when we do this in classes with kids especially you know they want to carve their name or write a message or write you know whatever right it's right. you know, it's, it's, kind of it's, it's a challenge it's fun it puzzle. can be a challenge for a lot of people yeah most it seems like most students you when you tell them that it will be backwards rather than backing off they just like take it as a challenge and say like, well then i'm going to figure out how to do it backwards and you know mixed results sometimes, but it's, it's right. a learning experience for sure. Right. So here's some of the tools, right, that you mentioned. So these are your carving tools. Can you talk, talk a bit about these other ones? Yes, uh, I will mention that the, the carving tools, that they are made in Japan and they're really terrific. Uh, you can uh, use any kind of carving tools actually, uh, but the Japanese made tools are the highest quality, uh, the highest quality steel. Um, but what is most uh, unique are the brushes. Uh, this is the, the way that you apply the ink to the, to the blocks. You, um, I mean, you spread it around and I will demonstrate this later. This is like a shoe brush kind of mm -hmm. brush. And then the other uh, unique tool is the, the Baron. This is a, a burnishing tool. 
in the uh, Western tradition, you can use a mechanical press or even a wooden spoon to uh, burnish the back of the paper. Uh, that won't work so well, the Japanese process. Uh, what, what does work is, uh, and it was invented in Japan too, um, is this barren, which is uh, made out of a bamboo sheath on the outside. And on the inside also is a bamboo rope that's coiled and it's a little bit bumpy and it just works really great to when you press on the back of the paper. And it's called a, a barren. This is a, actually handmade. Uh, I made this when I was uh, had my fellowship in Japan. Um, it's a really it's a really great tool. That's amazing that it's held up for so long. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah, so we'll talk a little bit more and see some of those tools in action um, in the second portion of our talk. Um, so now we're kind of getting into um, some examples more of your of your post fellowship work, I suppose. Right. So my work is uh, has a lot of colors. So if it has a lot of colors, it's going to have a lot of blocks and a lot of applications. So um, I will try my best to explain this. Um, you can see on the right is a block. And on the left is a print of that from that block. It's just one color. And it I is, have. It, it is so. Um, I know we're we're going to be looking at uh, the finished piece of this, but it is just so amazing seeing this one. And like, if you told me that that was just a map of islands <laughs> right. or the water from you know from space, I would I would believe it. It looks so much like that topographic kind of design. Right. I agree. So in the next slide, you will see the finished print on the right. That's typically what anybody would ever see when they look at my work. And it's actually an image from North Manitou Island. A lot of my work over the years has been um, of Sleeping Bear Dunes um, and around other places around the Great Lakes. Um, but like I said, this is the image on the right is typically what, what people see. And when I talk about my work, uh, one of the things, uh, that I find that people are interested in is uh, how is it made? So, uh, the eight little images that go with this are, uh, all images, single images from the different layers that are added all together to make the final image. So the first one is, the first color was this blue. The second color was this orangey yellow that was put on top of the first color. And then I've got uh, the next block here uh, for the third and the fourth layers and so on. The, so that's how all my images are made. This is a, I made this print just for educational purposes. This is um, small. Usually my prints are four, five, six times this size. Um, but uh, this, is, this is good for uh, demonstration explanations. That's so great. the next so slide. Oh, yeah. go ahead. So, so, so this, these eight, each of these is one single block, one single right. print, and then it's, on the next slide we have the actual yeah, process. Yeah. So this is what it would look like as I was working on it. So one color be, would be printed, and another color would be printed over the top. And you can see that the that the colors they're actually watercolor paint when they're applied over one another, they're transparent. So they sort of blend in, uh, blend, the colors blend over one another. And uh, that's the way that I work. So uh, I work, I do work a little bit like a painter and that I add these colors that, that blend over one another. Um, but the Japanese uh, technique of, the using transparent transparent watercolor layers allows me to do this too. 
another reason why I really liked uh, going to Japan and learning this is is for the reason of of water based water based paints. Uh, it's you know less toxic and you know uh, just uh, more environmentally friendly. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions here. We can pause to take since they pertain to this specific portion. Um, Susan asks, does there need to be a special order for the colors? You're talking about how they're transparent. Um, so I guess, yeah, I would assume that you have you have to think about when you're making your blocks and thinking about the order that you have to think about the imagery, but also the colors and how they'll be laying. I usually start for the broadest colors to the the biggest colors to the smallest colors. Mm. And they're usually, the larger areas are usually lighter and the darker areas are usually darker. Uh, if I do have really large dark areas, I print those, uh, I do print those last. I do also print the darker colors last. Okay. Um, and then Jan asked, how long does it take to carve a single block? And how long to carve all of the blocks for a given print? And I'm sure that that varies quite a bit um, based on it, the size, it complexity. Yes, it depends on uh, the size and the complexity. Um, I could probably carve this. Uh, I could carve this block, maybe both sides in a day. I'm not sure. Yeah. If I concentrated on it, I could get this done in a day, probably something this size. Wow. And that's, of course, not taking into account the time for sketching and planning and right, all, you right, know, right. Your actually, uh, car carving is actually the easiest part. Hmm. Yeah. It's yeah, not as I nuanced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was talking to a printmaker. Um, from signal return here in Detroit uh, the other week, and he was saying how you know it can be very that can be a very relaxing part of it once you have mm -hmm. the design. Just you know, just sitting and carving can be very you know meditative, and you know you're not dealing with exactly. the planning and the measuring and the math and all the other aspects of it. Um, exactly. So let's look at a few of your more finished pieces here, um, and these are from a series, correct? Right. This is a series of from. Uh, it's called Seasons. It's from a Japanese garden. I did uh, a print of each of the seasons. Uh, this is a rather large, uh, large print, 21 inches by 14 and a half. That's the image size. Now the Zen garden, you were talking about how long it would take to carve. Um, that took weeks to, car to carve that, um, all those, uh, all those de all that detail in the snow it was a really detailed uh, carving it plus it was large um, and the image on the right the waterfall image uh, that actually I worked on that for an entire year wow. it has a lot of uh, layers and a lot of different colors a lot of I actually changed the colors out as I went along I didn't like I didn't like it so I had to kind of start over um, I might add that if you ever have a chance to see these in person, they look a lot better in their round. <laughs> I have gallery representation in Saugatuck and in Glen Arbor. That information is on my website. If you're ever in those areas, um, I would highly recommend, uh, taking a look at them in person. Yeah, absolutely. And these these were um, the Meyer Gardens in uh, Grand yeah Rapids. Meyer Garden in Grand Rapids okay. yeah the one the image on the left actually was it, they have a an annual competition for images of their garden doesn't have to be the Japanese garden anywhere in the Meyer Garden and this actually won the competition oh wow I think it was either 2016 or 2017 oh that's great yeah that's a that's a beautiful beautiful space Thank there. You. Yeah. And beautiful piece of it. Thank you. Um, and then this is the, um, the, we saw this one at the beginning of the presentation. So this is also from a series. Right. This is a water lily series. This is uh, recent work. 
uh, I used to, uh, my series are in four now. I used to, I used to be a little bit more ambitious, but now I work um, in a series of four. It seems like I can get four done a year and that seems uh, pretty good. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, these are two images from my water lily series. I do work a lot. Uh, I, water is a lot of my subject matter. Um, and also floating is kind of a theme. And so here are uh, two from that series. I'm curious, you mentioned um, a series of four, you said about four, four pieces a year in a series. What does your, do you, is that, I'm just curious what your year, what your calendar kind of looks like. Is it, is that a, just sort of a loose rule? Is that like from January to December, do you have times of the year you're working more, times you're out taking photos more, times you're sketching, or is it just kind of always working and kind of just kind of going however it goes? Yeah, it's not, I'm not really strict in, about that, but I mean, sometimes I might get five done or, you know, three, sure, but. Sure. I, I I set out to do four, and I and my goal is to get four done each year. And um, I actually started making little sets of little mini portfolios in my note card uh, right. note card collection. And so that's kind of how it it started with uh, the inspiration for sets of four that makes that makes sense um and do you usually so say these are both 2022 do you usually complete one and then move on or do you often have multiple blocks multiple prints going multiple i usually have multiple images going at the same time like right now i have a lot of prints i have blocks that were carved a couple of years ago that i haven't printed I have designs that are waiting to be printed. I mean, waiting to be carved. Sure. Um, they're they're in all stages right okay. now. And here we have a few more. These are definitely very um, Michigan-looking scenes. Do you recall where these were based off of? Uh, the one on the left loop is from the Keweenaw Peninsula. And the one, or I mean, I'm mean, sorry, the one, yeah, that's the right. And Ascend on the left is from actually north of the bridge, north of the bridge in Ontario. Mm, okay. Yeah, these are great. We've got a few more. This is from that same area, uh, the Lake, Lake Superior watershed region. Uh, this is from my Floating World series. I might add that uh, the Japanese woodblock prints uh, from the era of Hokusai, the Great Wave, um, that was known as ukiyo-e, and translated into English, it means pictures of a floating world. Hmm. And so um, I have taken floating world as it, just the, the word itself, the words themselves um, as an inspiration. So the sun and the moon and the earth floating in space is uh, an inspiration. Water is an inspiration. Uh, me floating on water is an inspiration. Um, so I'm inspired uh, by the process, by the aesthetics, and also by uh, the poetics of uh, uh, from Japan and the concepts of uh, ukiyo-e. Yeah, and the floating on water, you mentioned these were actually um, from photos you took while in a canoe, is that right? Right. Well, the, the one on the left is actually on land, but the one on the right is I'm in a canoe. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah, these are these are beautiful. Um, and then you mentioned these, uh, yeah, these mini portfolios, these cards. Right. So this is if you, if someone doesn't 
isn't able to get to a gallery to see my work in person, um, this is a way to get my work out there to, more to a general audience. So it's uh, note, uh, note cards that I have. These are two um, sets that are at the Detroit uh, Institute of Arts gift shop. And uh, one, like I was describing earlier, is a True North series and a Floating World series. And they're also, um, I also have descriptions that are kind of inspired by Japanese haiku. Sounds great. That's great. Yeah, these are these are really lovely. I like I love the way they're packaged too. It's really the um the uh, images are so great, but the packaging is really pleasing too. Um, and I wanted to add too. We should have mentioned this earlier. In addition to you know these these being available in the museum shop, you also have several prints in the DIA's collection, which is really wonderful. And you know definitely something most artists can't brag about. Um, so that's really really great as well. Um, and I know you can find those through the DIA's website if you search the collection online. Um, prints, of course, are very, um, you know, delicate, and there's a lot of prints that are in the collection and not on view most of the time. But um, hopefully, we can all see them on the wall sometime soon. And I think this is our last slide. Um, okay. So now we're. We're going to move into the demo portion. Um, thanks again for joining us, everyone. Keep the comments and questions coming, and we'll get to them um, at the end or when there's a little there's a little time. So if we don't get your question right away, just hang tight. Okay, I'm going to uh, change cameras. I have a camera uh, above my my workstation here, and I'm going to describe uh, a little bit how I do things. All right, okay. let's see here. So uh, this is my workstation. Uh, ooh, I get my. Uh, so what I have here is uh, a design, and uh, it's the way my these, what the way my prints start is with a outline design, kind of like uh, a cartoon. So. I am going to show you what that would what that would look like. So here is a cartoon image of uh, a slice through a tree. So it's a tree ring, and this is what I call a pat my pattern. And this is what you use to draw your design onto your block. And how you decide the different colors, you can use different techniques. You can use, uh, you can take this pattern to a copy machine, or you can use uh, tracing paper. And so I've decided that I want one color to be gold and one color to be black. And so what I do is I use these layers as notes and then i use my pattern to lay out the uh, designs onto the blocks so uh and here i have my wood the the wood and the pattern are about the same size and uh the wood has uh, these, uh, they're called kento. And what they are, they're little carved paper shelves. And you put the pattern in the kento backwards. See, this is pattern is upside down. And I always mark my kento. Um, and then I put a piece of carbon paper. Let's see, I don't have my carbon paper. It's around here someplace. Uh, I don't know where my carbon paper is. Oh, here it is. 
your carbon paper under under there and you can tape tape this on here to hold it uh, and then you look at your notes and you uh, uh, transfer that design onto the block so you would simply trace around the edges I won't do the whole thing, but uh, lift it up, lift it up, and the and you transfer your design onto the on the on the block based upon what you've already figured out in advance. And when you when you print, then you put your uh, your printing paper right in the same uh, Kento uh, paper shelves. And that's how the registration, that's how the registration happens. The pattern and the, and the, uh, and the printing paper go in the same slots. So I'm gonna skip over any carving demonstrations uh, and I'm gonna get right into uh, printing. So uh, the wood is carved, and I've already uh, made uh, a couple impressions on this. So there's already color. Um, the the paint or the ink is actually, like I described earlier, watercolor paint. You can also you could also use pigments. I tend to use uh, Daniel Smith watercolor paint because it's really high quality and I can read uh, read the instruct read the ingredients and find out how light fast it is if it's carcinogenic uh, in Japan there's powdered pigments um, but I prefer knowing exactly what I'm using plus powdered pigments you have to use a mask and here's the here's the brush and the other uh, ingredient in Japanese uh, that I talked about earlier is the rice paste. It's called nori. It comes in a tube like this. Um, you, you squirt it out in a cup and you mix it with water so it becomes a little bit uh, a little bit runny, not too runny, but I might make it might add a little bit of water. So everything you see here is what you need for printing. You got the brush, the paste, you need water uh, for dampening your brushes. Um, just have one color at a, at a time near you so you don't get mixed up. And then you're barren. So it's a pretty uh, low tech uh, printing process, which I really love. So um, to prep, I'm going to just uh, water, put a little bit of water on my brush. Make sure it's a little moist so it just doesn't soak up everything. And I'm gonna brush a little bit on my block again so it gets a little bit moist. I don't know if anybody can hear the sound of that or not. Uh, sound is uh, an element in this process. When you brush on the when you brush the ink around the block, at first you hear it, you hear the bristles and then you, the pressure is lighter and lighter so that you don't hear the bristles anymore. Yeah, we can so hear that pretty just, well. It's picking it up. Okay, right good, here. good. So uh, you brush it around and then you uh, go back and forth really lightly. I'm holding onto the block very lightly a lot of times I hold on to it so lightly, it, it drops right out of my hand. Um, and I'm just gonna hold this up so you can see it in the light a little bit. You, you can see it so it's shiny. You got a nice smooth surface. See that? Okay. Now I'm gonna reach behind me. I have the uh, paper prepped already in a wet pack. 
And so this is the lovely Japanese paper. And I put a little X right here on the right hand corner. This goes in the Kento. So I'm gonna hold down with my thumb, my thumb here and drop it down. This is parchment paper. This is like a, uh, this just makes the barren very slippery. So it doesn't stick to the back of it. Um, paper. I'm going to pull this up. So that's a uh, pretty, wow. uh, <laughs> Um, and you can see it, you can see that texture uh, uh, prior to going on there, Ian was asking about uh, the texture. This, uh, this process does have a uh, texture to it. If you did not want that texture, you could add more layers or add more of the rice paste. Uh, you can see that um, there is a, you can see the wood grain in here. There is, you know, it's wood, there's grain. Um, you can uh, print so the wood grain shows up, but it takes uh, several layers. It also shows up a little bit better when you're using darker colors. Uh, okay, I'm gonna put this back in the wet pack. Can you tell us a little bit about the wet pack, what that, what that entails? Sure, I'll bring it right here. <laughs> this is the wet pack. Great. Let's see if I find room. Um, I before yesterday actually, I took some paper and um, and a and a blotter and I sprayed it with a handy dandy uh, spray brush mm -hmm. and um, let it sit overnight uh, so the paper is supple. So because we're using water. You know, imagine a, you know, a paper towel or something. If it just one spot and it gets wet, it's going to swell. So uh, by having the entire sheet of paper wet, it just keeps the structure of the paper more stable. So it does, you know, so one area just doesn't swell up. Mm. Um, and then when you put it in, put it into the wet pack, uh, you stagger it. So uh, one sheet isn't exactly on top of the other. It's a little bit of uh, engineering involved. Uh, so like if I was to make a whole edition of this, this wet spot would be, and underneath it would be there and there and there. Um, mm -hmm. So because you wanna keep the moisture uh, even throughout the whole uh, print. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to print on that layer again, I would have, I would wait. I wouldn't do it. Um, I wouldn't do it immediately. So I'm going to move this back and then I'm going to add another color. Okay. I'm going to print this, uh, in black, you can see I've printed it red before. That's one of the uh, one of the things that you can do in printmaking is you can change the colors. Another uh, another tidbit is that uh, you a lot of times you have different brushes for the different color families. So you generally speaking, you have uh, one set of brushes just for yellow because yellow can get contaminated pretty easily. Mm. Like you wouldn't want to use a black brush and then use yellow. See, this is marked as my black brush, like do not use yellow on this brush. So I'm gonna uh, moisten this a little bit. It's a little bit dry sounding because there's dried ink on here from when I was practicing earlier today. 
So I'm just getting, you can kind of see uh, the low areas and high areas in this block. Let me say real quick too, I see we've got a few questions in the chat, but we'll wait till um, we get this a second layer printed. That way we're not, uh, not talking over It looks over like we have a lot of time, so I'll, I'll be able to yeah. do this a couple, couple of times. Cool, cool. Okay, so that's just water right now, but you can see um, uh, how textural this is. And the, one of the things, um, one of the beauties of this, uh, this of being an artist of this, um, of this process is, you know, working with the materials. You can't see all of that in the in the uh, final image. You can't see all the wood. You can't you can't hear it. <laughs> you mm -hmm. can't smell it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is something that the artist uh, can. You know, you can hear it. You can smell it. You can touch it. Um, so th again, this is uh, the nori. The nori acts as a binder. Okay, we'll spread it around. Okay, again, you can just kind of see that it's all shiny. It's a visual art. You can see everything. Okay, it would be hard to know uh, which direction to put this in, except that, oh, look, <laughs> I marked it. You'd be surprised um, uh, how often I get it wrong. Not very often. <laughs> <laughs> Only when I'm thinking about something else. Drop it down. Press on the back. And you can kind of see how the image is coming through the back of the page. And that's how it's done. Very so, nice. um, no, thank you. So, uh, yeah. That's it. That's great. Uh, one question. So if you're doing a series of these, um, like, you know, we talked at the very beginning about, you know, a series of 30, would you do all of your first layer yellow? Would you do 30 of those? Or would you go through and do, like, what's the, what would the process be for, for doing a whole series? Um, to, it's called an addition. Addition, um, yes. Yeah. So uh, I would do one color, I would like do 10 or 15 or however many I was making, I would do one color at a time on, mm -hmm. on all the paper that I have prepped. Okay. Um, we had a question here, Jan asked, uh, what kind of wood are the blocks made from? The wood is called Sheena plywood. Mm. And uh, most of these materials are uh, from McLean's. And it's an online catalog. Um, they're based in Portland, Oregon, Oregon. And the website is imclains.com. And it's called, again, it's called Sheena Plywood. That's great. Um, they also asked, what happens if you make a mistake? Uh, which you've been doing this for a long time. I imagine that came up at some point. Uh, what is the stage, which is the absolute worst to make a mistake? I cannot imagine. <sighs> um, probably the worst thing that could happen is that I put the paper on upside down or something oh. uh, at the at the 30th print or something like mm. that. But that doesn't happen very often. And uh, honestly, sometimes if I do make a mistake and I don't tell anybody, 
<laughs> nobody would nobody would notice <laughs> because what I did was very what I did in this example is very graphic and very simple how I work you know in the many many layers um, mm. it's um, usually the layers are very very light um, and then uh, not, they're not by themselves uh, very perceptible um, but I have all these safeguards for uh, uh, not making mistakes. Um, you know, one measure how tired I am. Uh, <laughs> if I'm tired, I stop. Uh, two, I do the most difficult work uh, at the beginning. Um, and I have, you know, like the little X's or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like c making mistakes, carving, um, I usually, there's workarounds for that too. Um, probably the worst thing that could happen is that I get a, a bad piece of wood, something mm -hmm. that has uh, like a seam in it or something like that, that you can't see until you've mm -hmm. already started carving in it. And I have actually uh, recarved whole blocks because there's a seam that shows up and I, I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, okay. So yeah, I guess that that does seem just in a, in any process when you have so so many steps. Yeah, that is, but it does seem like you've got such good, like you said, safeguards to make sure, um, you know, those things don't come up. Um, Susan asks, no bleeding. I assume she means the ink, and hopefully not a a carving incident. Um, but with that first layer going onto the wet paper, um, yeah, it, it it does seem like. You know, using that paper towel example, it does seem like the ink would spread. But is that just through the the type of ink? The the uh... yeah, the uh, the ink gets in, actually embedded into the paper. It doesn't stay on top. Uh, you can see it goes it goes all the way through, or mm -hmm. you know, all the way into the paper. So it's it's embedded into it. Unless you were unless you had really uh, like a thick layer. It's, it's not going to uh, offset, but uh, it will offset if you uh, aren't careful. And so again, there's all kinds of uh, safeguards against that. Having a, a pad of newsprint right next to you, perhaps, and like as soon as you get done printing, like uh, put newsprint over the top to like, pick up any uh, ink that didn't get embedded. Uh, but yeah, you put it right into the wet pack, one on top of the other. It, there's no uh, offset. That means ink getting on the next piece of paper mm -hmm. or bleeding, which would be uh, spreading. Um, it would, the ink would bleed or spread if uh, the paper was too wet. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes some colors do bleed, um, spread more than others. Uh, red tends to bleed more than uh, other colors. Spread, you know, migrate, I guess I call it. Uh, um, yeah, and here's some, here are samples of this, these blocks hmm. printed in different colors. This was the red that was on the block. This was, a, I put a smaller uh, color on the inside. This is a, you know, one, a third color added. This is just the outside ring. And so you can, you can play around with it. It, it actually can be, it actually is a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. I, en I enjoy the flexibility of it and, you know, all the parts and pieces to it. That's great. Uh, one last question here. Um, we've got a few more minutes if anyone has any more questions or comments and wants to get them in. But Jan also asked, what is the purpose of the wet pack? Which I think you explained was just to sort of keep the paper a consistent level of moisture, um, keeping the keeping the paper even. Yeah, the the paper uh, by itself when it's when it's dry is uh, it's a tiny bit stiff hmm. and it has what they call sizing in it. Uh, which is a animal an animal glue actually um, and so if you printed the paper dry 
Well, you, you can if you were just using one color, but if you're using multiple colors, uh, you need to have the, the moisture of the paper stable throughout. Uh, and so it's, you get it wet in advance and keep it wet throughout the process so you don't get, uh, the paper doesn't stretch unnecessarily when you print it. Okay, great. Um, all right. Well, uh, you mentioned a little bit about your gallery representation. Anything up else coming up for you on the horizon? Any upcoming exhibitions, shows, releases? Um, anything else we should know about or you want to talk about? Uh, yeah, I do have an exhibition with my sensei in Hudson, um, or Sylvania, Ohio. Um, oh. It's at Hudson Gallery. That's uh, the first, it starts uh, June 3rd, actually, in just a couple of weeks. Oh, and then wow. he and I are having a joint exhibition in Kalamazoo in 2023. Oh, that's great. All right. I assume the, the info will all be on your website and on your social media and whatnot. So right. we'll an eye right. out. that sounds great. Ohio and Kalamazoo, both those both sound like uh, very doable trips to go see these in person. All right. Well, if we don't have any more comments, I think we can wrap this up. But thank you so much for joining yeah, us today, you're Mary. Uh, your work you're is really inspiring. It really makes me want to makes makes me want to do a lot of things. It makes me want to print. It makes me want to drive out to Lake Michigan. It makes me want to just sit outside and draw. Um, it's just such a great, uh, I don't know, great inspiring work, you know, for thank you so like, much about this warm weather and, you know, appreciating uh, the environment around us and Gail's giving some. Yeah. I'm and looking forward to the warm weather too. <laughs> yeah. All right. And thank us. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks, Mary. Um, excited to see more of your work. Um, stick around or come back rather next week. We've got um, a virtual tour of the Asian galleries with Ray, Frank, Frida, and Jill. Um, yeah. Thank you for joining. We'll see you next month.